So I'm going to have to move along here quickly because it's, we're, we're well into the service time here. So I need you to hang with me or I'm going to do a little bit of history, a little, uh, little bit of Bible study kind of thing, and then I want to make an application to us. But this is a sermon about camping out. I went back and looked through my childhood. Now, many of you know I grew up in New York City, so you may not imagine that I ever did any camping out. And I'm not talking camping out in the backyard or anything like that. I mean real camping. But from the time I was about 10 or 11 years old when I entered uh, Boy Scouts, when, you know, I would spend about 20 to 30 days a year camping all the way through uh, my college years, all the way through my college years. And in college, it was particularly interesting because when I went to Concordia University in Portland and I lived in New York City, they would close the campus for like Thanksgiving. So where do you go? I can't go anywhere. I went camping. So I went camping in Oregon in like November and in March. Think about that for a second. It's really bad, really bad. So I did a lot of camping. And when I say camping, what I mean is sleeping on the ground in a sleeping bag with a tent, maybe. That's the camping I'm talking I'm not talking about an RV, okay? Somebody has told me they went camping with an RV. I'm going, are you kidding? That's not camping. That's, car that's taking your motel room with you. In fact, now, however, having said that, and then when I got married, my wife and I went camping for many years, and we always tent camped, always tent camped, and finally we discovered a cool invention called an air mattress. <laughs> that was kind of cool. Um, and so... Heck, I'm seeing Steph and we slept in the dirt together in Mexico, down there camping out for Mexico trips and all kinds of things. So can't, I'm, I'm accustomed to camping. I'm accustomed to spending a lot of days, a lot of days and nights on the ground camping out. But it's nothing compared to 40 years of camping out. Can you imagine? I can't even begin to imagine what 40 years of camping out must have been like. Day after day after day in carrying your tents, carrying your stuff with you, 40 years. I'm going to give you some history here because in the end it begs a question, what in the world is God doing in this thing? What is God doing? We have these 40 years where they're wandering around in the desert camping out. He had made a promise and it took 40 years for them to get it, to see it realized. So here, now, I want to make it a little lighthearted. Show my, show my slides here. This is how I usually draw how the, how the Israelites wandered through the desert because it's a mess. They wander all over the place for 40 years. And so, um, th so that, that's the story, right? I'll give you the basic framework of the story. They are um, they're slaves in Egypt. God sends Moses they are released from slavery. They travel out to the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army chases them. They cross the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is destroyed. They go to Mount Sinai. God gives them the Ten Commandments. They build a golden calf, really stupid. And then God punishes them there. And then they go on. And then they blow it again. And because they blow it a second time, in a big bay, God says, we're going to do, we're, you have to wander around for 40 years, okay? So that's how they wander around. Second one, what's the, show me the second one. Good news, just 40 laps around the wilderness for disobeying God. Bad news, each lap takes a year. There you go. Next one. Next rest area, 40 years. Ha ha, that's funny. Okay, and then the last one here. Uh, he's got a smartphone, Moses does. Cross the Red Sea, turn right at Mount Sinai, reach destination, probably, okay, it's, whatever. It's not that funny. All right, next one. Here's the map. You see Egypt over here to the left, right? Follow the arrows, cross the Red Sea, head down south to Mount Sinai, head up north. See that town called Kadesh Barnea? They're right on the edge of going into the promised land. They get there fast. They are released from bondage and slavery. They have seen miraculous things happen. They've complained a little, maybe more than a little, but they've complained, but pretty quickly, they're right there on the edge of going into the promised land. So what does God do? So send, send 12 guys out. Check out the land, 12 spies. 10 of them come back and say, we can never do this. It's awesome, this land is awesome, but they're like giants and they have walled cities. We could never do it. We are too weak and too pitiful. Two of the spies, Caleb and Joshua, say, God said we could do it, let's do it. 
God punishes them for their disobedience at Mount Sinai and for their unfaithfulness at Kadesh Barnea. And he says, this generation, you do not trust me. I need a generation that will trust me. And so he says, for 40 years until every, all, this whole generation dies out and the next generation gets to go into the promised land. And that's what happens. See the next bunch of arrows? Go to the next map. So I've highlighted a little bit. So they wander around. They go through the hill country of Paran, and then they go to Edom. They go to Moab. Next slide, last one. And then they're right on the edge. Forty years later, Moses dies, and they have a conquest of Canaan. They enter in from the east side, cross the Jordan River to Jericho, and then conquer uh, the Promised Land. So anyway, that's the history of it. Now what I want to do with you, if you'll indulge me, I guess you have no option, you're sitting there. So um, we're going to put it up here, but there's a printed one for you. There's four steps in this journey that I want to highlight for you. Four steps in this journey, and if you'll follow with me here quickly, because this is a 40-year faith walk. 40-year faith walk in which they're camping out every night until they finally get into a place where they can build homes and build cities, and they can have a land which they call their own. In fact, they occupy lands and cities which they did not build, and so forth. But they, uh, they, that's, the, that's the goal. And here are the four steps. Let's see if you can relate to this at all, but I'm going to tie it in. But this is what the Israelites go through. Number one, number one, they begin with wide-eyed optimism and wonder. Have you ever done that? I, I've had that happen to me. I've been through a lot of building projects in churches and schools. Um, in a, I, I think I added them up. I'm at about number 11 or 12 in different settings, in Seattle, in Portland, in different places, and here in Pocatello, different building projects. And I remember when we were going to build this high school over here, so it's like 30,000 square feet, two stories, big gym, high school lab, you know, the whole bit. And one of the contractors who bid it for us said this, said this to the group. We said, how complicated do you think this will be, and how long will it take? And he said, it's no big deal. It's like building a big house. No, it's not like building a big house. You're building a high school. It's a whole nother matter. And yet, I tell you what, you can get some people excited if you can tell them, we can do it fast, we can do it cheap, we can do this, and your eyes get big and you go, wow, I might be able to afford it. And we can, oh boy, this will be great. And that's what happened to the Israelites on the start of this journey. Wow, God saved us from Pharaoh. You see all those miracles he did? Did you see how he showed up Pharaoh and how he killed his army? Did you see how God parted the Red Sea and all of the army drowned in the Red Sea? Did you see that? And they're sitting there singing songs and whoop, whoop, you know, they're doing all of this and we're, gonna, we're going to the promised land. And man, they make headway and they, they start off and their eyes are wide and they are optimistic. And they're filled with wonder because they have seen the hand of God. And they have seen the hand of God act firmly and, and his promises come true and it's for them. And they are feeling like they are specially chosen and they are specially loved by God. And that journey begins with a lot of optimism. Have you ever done that on a journey yourself? Begun a journey with a lot of optimism? How about what's the next step? Here's the second step because this is what happens. You get to debilitating pessimism and purging. When you discover that building the high school is not like building a big house and that you really don't know how that science lab is supposed to go in and you really didn't realize that a 10,000 square foot hardwood floor was more complicated than you thought, you can get pretty pessimistic. And so as the people of God are traveling along, what do they begin to do? Some of you know this, right? Many of you know this. They bellyache, they complain, they complain, and they bellyache, and it's over and over and over. God, why are we here? What's going wrong? Don't you love us? This is no fun. Where's the water? How come this food is the same every day? We don't like it. We're unhappy. You don't love us. You don't take care of us, and it's relentless. Parents, any of you put up with that on a long drive? Any teachers put up with that from students through the course of a year? Parents, right? an unceasing, relentless, what's going on, you don't, what's, it's pessimism, it's this constant stream of pessimism, and that's what happens to the Israelites too, don't they? In fact, I quoted this for you, 
He says, remember this and never forget how you provoked the Lord your God to anger in the desert. From the day you left Egypt until you arrived here, you have been rebellious against the Lord. You've been bellyaching, complaining. You don't trust him. You don't believe him. From the day you left until now. Now there's some purging that goes along here too because to be honest, when you're in a journey like this, there does come a point, I, this happened to me, where my father once said, he, he stopped the car and he told us to get out. And we got out. And he drove around the block and I about wet my pants. <laughs> I mean, he was so angry at how my brothers and I were just relentless in this pessimism, this negative negativity, and he said, I'm done. And I think he needed to drive around the car, or drive around the block so he didn't kill us all. <laughs> you know, gather himself together for a moment. But I'm not kidding, for those three or four minutes while we were out there, we're like, what do we do now? Um, and I, we, did, we did stop complaining after that. But there's pessimism, there's just debilitating pessimism. And the Israelites experienced that, and that's the kind of piece of the journey. But then, but then after that, and there's this purging, there's this discipline, there's this correction. God says to him, you were not faithful. Here's the deal. It doesn't mean I don't love you. And it doesn't mean that I won't forgive you and I don't care for you. But you're not entering the promised land because you are unfaithful and you don't trust me. And so a new generation is going to inherit the promised land and we're going to have to get them ready. And, and get this, this is the interesting thing. That generation that was not allowed in, they were the ones training the generation that would go in. Isn't that interesting? They were the ones who had to, and I'll tell you what, they did a pretty good job of it. Because even though they would not receive the reward, and Moses doesn't either, remember? Moses doesn't get to go either. Even though only Caleb and Joshua were the ones that were allowed in for their faithfulness from that generation, it was that unfaithful generation that began training the generation that would conquer the promised land and inherit the land. And so it's interesting, you know, remember, I don't know about you, I can distinctly remember it in my mind when the first Rocky movie came out, I was a very young man at the time, when the first Rocky movie came out, and it was a certain formula, and it's a common formula, and it's true in lots of movies, but now you see it in almost any kind of adventure movie or, you know, any kind of movie like that, Star Wars or Mission Impossible or whatever. But in Rocky, right, he's kind of, a, he's kind of like a bum, but he gets a shot. He's going to get a shot. He's going to be a contender, you know? He's going to really make it. And things look good, and he's going good, and things are good. So he's all optimistic about the opportunities he's going to get, and then he gets, he just gets just not beat out of him. And he's just down, and I'm no good, and I'm a bum, and it's this and that. And then somebody comes into his life and says, we're going to turn this around. And all of a sudden the music changes, and it's the eye of the tiger, and he's chasing chickens around the yard, and he's beating up meat things, and he's climbing up the stairs of Philadelphia, and he stands up there, and he's jumping around. Remember, this is the formula in movies, isn't it? Right? You got all this optimism. Your optimism is dashed. Then somebody comes and says, you can do it. We'll train you to do it. And then you do it. And then when he walks into the ring for the final scene, he is a lean, mean, fighting machine. You know he's going to win right? That's this formula. The third step in this, the third piece of it is developing strength and thanksgiving or thankfulness. Developing strength, and th that's the journey that these Israelites on. They now have to develop a strength, a confidence in the Lord, a confidence in who He is, a gratitude for what God has done. This is the training program. It's something that their parents didn't learn and now have to teach their kids. And that's what they're doing, teaching and preparing and training them for their journey to go into the promised land. And then it leads us to the fourth thing. I find the farmer's insurance ads kind of cute. We know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. Have you seen those? We know a thing or two because we... That's a very humble, modest way of saying something like, get out of my way, I'm an expert. I know what I'm doing. And number four is when they stand on the edge of the promised land with, with General Joshua, I will tell you what, they have between one and two million people who are steely-eyed warriors who have been through it. 
They know a thing or two because they've not only seen a thing or two, they've done a thing or two. They have been attacked on all sides. Their faith, their God, their commitment has been questioned, and they have continued to journey relentlessly, ultimately to the promised land, so that when they are ready to enter in, when they're ready for that conquest, and when I say kind of, what do I say, steely-eyed confidence and action. And I don't mean that in some rotten, mean way. I really mean it as we know who we are, we know what we've been through, we know whose God we serve, we know, who, we know where we're going. Let's do it. Okay, that's the story that we get here. That's the story of the Israelites. Now, to make it make sense for us, it's your story too. I think that's what the connection is here. My question to you would be, where are you on this journey? Some people, when they come to faith, right? Isn't it awesome? I'm loved like that. I have a Jesus who loves me that much. I'm a child of God. He offers me forgiveness. I don't have to earn my salvation. You mean I... You're kidding, right? I'm part of the family of God. I have a whole group. It's awesome. Let's do this thing. And you know, Christians, when they first come to faith, sometimes it's like, this is going to be great. It's going to be all skittles and rainbows, and there will be no problems ever. And we know it's not true. Because it doesn't take long, particularly for the devil, the world, and our own, our own weaknesses. But the devil gets a little unhappy when people are committed to Jesus Christ. And so, just like I wrote this column that said, when you're taking a lot of flack, you're probably near the, near the target. That could be true in your Christian life, too is that when you're taking heat, you might be near the target, which is Jesus Christ. And so sometimes it leads to depression, to pessimism, to say this wasn't everything the pastor promised it would be. This wasn't everything my friend told me it would be. I thought this was always going to be easy. And boy, there are times in our life, in our walk with Jesus Christ, in our journey, where sometimes we may, along with the Israelites, say, where's the water, Lord? When are we going to get home? You took care of the Egyptians, but now you're not taking care of us. This food is pretty boring. It's the same thing every week. You say the same stuff. When's it going to get better? And boy, we can fall into a pessimistic thing where I'm afraid sometimes God is the bus driver wants to say, I'm stopping this car and you're getting out. And thank God he never does. He doesn't stop the bus and say, get out. But his patience is constant. His patience is relentless. And he's patient with them and he's patient with us. And then when that time comes when we stop and we say, okay, Lord, I get it. Your promises are true. And I am your child. But we live in a world that's broken. And I'm still wrestling with some brokenness. Let's do some training. Let's do some training. Because, Lord, I want to get to a point someday where I can stand there with some steely-eyed confidence and know nothing anyone says, nothing anyone comes at me with, no temptation, no hurt, no assault can ever take away from me the promises of goodness that you have done on my behalf. Nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Death, life, height, depth, nothing. I want that kind of confidence. But it's a journey, isn't it? For these folks, it was 40 years. Anybody 40 years in yet? 50, 60, right? Some of you are maybe one year in. It's a journey. Thank God we journey together. Now, here's the last thing I want to share with you on this, because now I want to give you really good news. The Jewish people thought, there's a passage here that says, If we are careful, this is Deuteronomy 6, if we are careful to obey all the laws before the Lord our God as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. You know, when the people were slaves in Egypt, okay, hang with me for a minute because this is going to be the important part. When they were slaves in Egypt, I love this tender passage. God says to Moses, I have heard the cries of my people in bondage and slavery. God's heart was breaking for them. I have heard their cries, and I am going to save them. In the New Testament, folks, I want you to know this. 
I believe Jesus says the same thing. I have heard the cries of my people in bondage to the demands of the law, and I need them to know I have fulfilled it. I need them to know that their righteousness does not come in obeying and being obedient to the law. Their righteousness comes from me. Their righteousness comes in the cross. Their righteousness comes in that which I have done for them. I have adopted them in the waters of baptism. I have washed them clean of their sins. I have welcomed them to my table and given them and fed them with my own body and blood that they will know. I have gathered them into a community in which I, as the center, when I'm the center, has no fear, has every promise, and are called the very children of God, inheritors of the kingdom of heaven. That, my friends, is true. And that is our righteousness in our journey. So you may be at various steps on this journey. God bless you. They're godly steps. They're steps which God knows about, steps which God put into place, and steps which God takes before you and with you every step of the way. To God be the glory. Amen.